Chet, Mac, we good? We're good to go. You guys all ready? You got like one of those things you can camera action. Hey, hey, hey! Let's whistle. Um, want to welcome guys to uh, Web Group. Thanks, guys, for letting us talk and do our spiel here. Um, want to give you guys a brief intro. I know you really don't give a shit about like who we are as people or who Dynamic is. I want to add value to you guys and give you guys back. So, really, to set it up, like this is a conversation. So, if you guys have questions as we're going through, like let us know. Stop us. Raise your hand. We'll call on you. Don't want this to be a presentation behind the curtain and us monkeys on the stage. Not trying to have that here. So definitely let us know if you guys have questions as we're going throughout. Um, my name is Phil. Uh, I work for Dynamit. I'm a partner and director of design at Dynamit. Um, get to lead a wonderful design team. Some of the guys are back there right now. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it about me. Yeah, and I'm Adam. Uh, I'm a solutions architect at Dynamit. I've been there about four months now. Recently came down here from Cleveland to escape snow and find better football teams. So. There you go. Happy to be there here. Um, a quick brief intro about Dynamic, if you, none of you are familiar with who we are. Um, obviously local here in Columbus, we have about 85 employees right now. We work across spectrums. Um, we do retail hospitality, um, QSR. You got to shut that updater down, man. Um, QSR and healthcare. I mean, we're working with clients like Victoria's Secret, Whataburger, Panda Express. Um, if you guys want to know more about who we work with after, just pull me aside and we'll have a beer and we'll talk about it. Um, but that's kind of just a brief overview about who Dynamit is. Bam. First slide. Bam. So one of the things that we really wanted to kind of kick this off with is, no, nope, not that. <laughs> Do you have it like Your auto computer playing? is just hijacking. Yeah. It's just hijacking our present right Jeez. now. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, software projects are complicated, obviously. <laughs> that's pretty clear. And apparently so is uh, Preview. How do we even get this back here? Like I don't go. know. You have a terrible computer. <clears throat> yeah, so software projects are obviously really complicated. Um, I mean, they require tons of information really to operate uh, and complete successfully. You know, one of the biggest causes I think of some of this complication though is the inefficient communication that happens really. Um, so, you know, stakeholders, you have many people involved, you have a lot of different information. Um, and really, you know, this leads to a few things happening. You know, one, software is delivered late and often over budget. Um, and documentation is sporadic. I mean, I think exactly. all of us are very familiar with the different methodologies and stuff in which you approach a software build. But there's so much documentation that happens inside these. I mean, some of them could be website redesigned, so the scope and stuff is very much right here. But you could build large applications where it's a year long. That documentation becomes very, very vast and hard to keep it, keep control of. So I think how you deliver that and how, you know how you keep it together are two of the things that really kind of let software projects stray from scope, from budget, from expectations of clients, things like that. So yeah, and a lot of the current uh, I guess deliverables are very technical focused, and that's one of the challenges is that. A lot of the people that you're communicating with on the client side are usually non-technical, so there's a bit of a disconnect between what they're expecting and what we're giving them. So um, what we've been doing here at Dynamit is really kind of focusing around how do we really improve that in a way that makes a lot more sense, leads to better projects, and ultimately makes us more Yeah, fun. I mean, and the, and the two things that we try to do really is, is organize that content. Organization and communication are kind of the two big things that we focus on when we, we talk about IDD, which we'll define here in a second. But those two things are what we want to focus on as we're going through a software project, because those are the most important things to make that software project successful. Do the next one. Yep. So you kind of mentioned it. Uh, IDD, uh, we call interface-driven design or interface-driven development. Kind of depends what side of the equation that you sit on here. Um, <clears throat> as to what the final D is. But really, it's a, a philosophy and a methodology that we use here at Dynamit. Um, really, it's basically just a grouping of deliverables. And some of the deliverables that we're going to touch on are uh, package indexes, information architecture, and then a user experience design document. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, too, it, it serves many purposes. You know, it's a blueprint, blueprint for build. So we have a team that's supposed to keep this thing intact and build and design and, and, and deliver to our clients. It's also a communication tool. So as, a, as you deliver that to clients, you know, how do you communicate something that's super technical? You know, this kind of bridges the gap between the non-technical user and the super technical user. Yeah, so really the, the purpose of the IDD docs uh, are really to kind of simplify that communication. And I think one of the big challenges that we have is you know, a lot of times the requirements that you end up getting as part of a software project you know, they really don't 
encompass the entire scope of the project. There's a lot of things that exist outside yeah. of your typical requirements, you know, things like non-functional requirements around security or platforms or testing. Even content. Yeah, that need to be documented in a way uh, that helps you really understand what the full scope of the project is. <coughs> Want to jump into deliverables? Yeah, let's hit the next one. So IDD, um, Interface Driven Design or Development, however we say it, we say them both, um, it's, a, it's a philosophy. It's a methodology that we use at Dynamit. Um, Adam mentioned that there are three pieces of it, the first one being the package index. Um, the, the first thing about it is the package index is, you know, it's, it's a grouping or a taxonomy that we use to kind of chunkate and make bite-sized pieces out of larger applications. At Dynamit, we build a lot of large applications. Um, so to break those things down and make them easier to attain, to present, the process kind of influenced that as well. This taxonomy of the package index allows us to break those things down. Mm -hmm. And really what we kind of do with the package index is really try to break things down into small uh, pieces of functionality. So if you're thinking about this from, you know, like a typical application, something might be like user authentication might be a package, mm -hmm. right? So that kind of represents one small piece of functionality that exists within the application. And then from there, we really kind of take those things and break them down even further into uh, components and interfaces. And interfaces could be, you know, just uh, something graphical like a, a login screen or something that is a little bit more abstract, like connecting to a, a, a service to validate that authentication. Totally. <coughs> what else we got here? Um, the package index itself is really broken up into three tiers. Adam kind of just mentioned those. I mean, the package components and interfaces. And so those, in, those three definitions kind of keep us in line as we're marching down the, the path of a software build. Um, you know, as we march down those, you can see the graphic kind of represents those. You want to go to the next one? Yeah. There you go. Um, we, we break those things out. And so when we're looking at an application for user authentication as an example, you know, if we're building a system that has authentication, everybody on the, on the build team knows that Package A is user authentication. Inside package A, A.1, we have that component. That component is a grouping of functionality. So login would be that. And inside that, we have interfaces. And those interfaces are what's defined in that workflow for our user. So we also define those non-functional interfaces inside that as well. So we've illustrated two here. We've got A.1.1, which is a login prompt. And myself and the design team, for us, we know like what interfaces we're developing. We're actually designing the workflow for the user. But for the development team, they know that inside of user login, we're making an API call. If we're relying on a third party service, um, we work with, uh, with Hilton, one of our biggest clients. They have a huge authentication system that we have to tap into and make sure that's documented in any application that we build. So we make sure that's documented inside this so that everybody knows exactly what we're building as we're going down the pipe. Yeah. I think another thing that we really wanted to uh, key on here is, uh, this process makes it very easy to estimate things because we're well, breaking the them down thing. into very small chunks and you're able to estimate those chunks in a way uh, that makes things a lot easier. I mean, trying to estimate the full scope of an application, really difficult, but really just trying to dive into just the user authentication piece, um, it's a lot easier to kind of segment that out and say, this is how long it's gonna take me to develop this screen, this yeah. is how long it's gonna take me to write this service, all those different things. You can kind of come together across all the different teams and really find out what is the, uh, you know, the end hour is going to be for And for us, piece. I mean, at Dynamic, our exercise is to do that collectively. So, I mean, we bring our disciplines together. We bring our developers, our designers, our AMs, our PMs to come together and actually look at this package index. This, is, this serves as our kind of foundation to look at an application build and say, what does it actually take? What, what are we actually going to do here? Design team, how many interfaces are we actually going to build? And sometimes we have to blow these out, things out farther. We have a role that is our architect, solutions architect Dynamic, that is responsible for putting this thing together. But the team collectively comes together and says, how do we do this? What does that breakdown look like? Are there things we haven't uncovered today? Um, Estimation is a huge, huge part of this package index. I mean, I think all of us are very technology enabled people here and we do this for a living. And so estimation of software um, is one of the biggest problems and challenges, especially when they get larger. Um, this has proven us um, really well to, to be able to do that more effectively than we, than we used to. Yeah. And even just since joining Dynamite, I mean, not having known this process before I started here, seeing how this really works, I mean, it really makes a lot of sense. Um, the next piece we wanted to touch on 
is what we call information architecture. And really what this does for us is it helps to define sort of the non-functional scope. So this could be things like uh, content or navigation or even workflows that exist within a, a large application. So really trying to document instead of the features and functionality, just sort of the non-functional th pieces, content and th that sort of stuff. Sure. I mean, I think you mentioned content. I mean, content tends to be a linchpin in a lot of the application builds that we have. Um, you know, you have a client you're engaged with and they think that you are engaging them and doing everything. They have homework as well. I mean, everybody has homework in these processes. Um, for us, this information architecture allows us to kind of use the Dewey Decimal System, if you will, to kind of put a taxonomy and an organization around the types of content that are on the site. We'll go inside and audit the site, look at all the pages that are there, and really put a plan together for our clients to say, here's the content you need to look at to develop new, to inject into this document. We make a lot of break off documents from this as well yep. um, that allow them to kind of understand the full scope of content that's in the application. A lot of times it goes over overlooked. I mean, I think you look at content as just the, the last minute thing, but mm -hmm. in reality, that's a, that's a huge linchpin when you're building a software product. Exactly, and it, it could be very extensive too. I mean, you think about large e-commerce sites or sites with lots of information, um, you know, content makes up a significant portion of the work that's ultimately going to be done. Mm -hmm. But being able to classify this separately from, you know, what we kind of typically call interfaces, which are essentially just displaying articles of content, allows us to really sort of understand what the full scope is. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big <clears throat> distinction for us that we that we have to define with our clients, and we're very, very keen on kind of a shared verbiage set as we're going down the pipeline. Um, you look at uh, someone that says template or somebody that says interface or somebody that says a content page, you know, you start to get lost in the whirlwind of what does that actually mean? And even those, that little minutia can kind of blow a scope out of the water. Um, for us, there's a big differentiation between templates and content, you just mentioned it. Um, you can look at information architecture and see all the pages of content. It's a sitemap. I mean, it sounds simple. I mean, all of us know what a sitemap is. The difference is, is when we go to estimate that, when we actually build out those workflows, we can say what unique interfaces actually power that. So a design team member knows, a developer knows, a front end and a back end guy knows how many interfaces are we actually going to have to design, develop, and build to facilitate this number of content pages. Mm -hmm. So you can really kind of pull that apart and make the distinction. And so we may have a huge site that has a thousand pages of content and use one unique template. And so like we can kind of come together and make sure that we're all aligned on what needs to be unique versus what needs to be um, part of a template. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think that's a good, a good point actually is really having that shared language across the teams. I think that's one of the things that you encounter when you work in larger teams is not everyone's really speaking the same language. So having that defined as far as what is a template, what is an interface, and being able to talk about that amongst yourselves effectively is, is super important. I have a question about that. So you said that Good. the team is going to come together and just decide what are the different screens that you need for this work. Sure. So how would they know it's just intuition or experience? Or would they actually do mock-ups? Could you repeat it? Absolutely, absolutely. You're actually jumping the gun, which I love. Um, one of the things that we do is, I think there's a lot of, there's intuition there. I mean, I think the people that we have estimating these projects have done this before. They know and understand, you know, what a system's supposed to do. If you tell me my account or you tell me an e-commerce X or shop, I know exactly what needs to go in there. But we have team members that don't, per se. Um, what we actually do is we look at those package index, like we mentioned earlier, and those things really allow us to kind of break that down. You actually give us a nice segue. You want to flip yep. to the next one? The next piece, and this is what I think the actual gold is of this entire entire kind of organizational set, set of deliverables. Um, so far, we've talked about the package index and information architecture. Those things are meant really to just define comprehensive scope. They bring things together. They bring features, which we're going to build, and content, which we're going to supply to these, to these, to these interfaces. Um, but they don't talk about behavior. They don't talk about really unpacking like what the login workflow looks like. Because if you say login, I think things like, well, I need a login screen. I need error states. I need um, the ability if it's not, you know, if it's not validated. You know, what happens in those forgot passwords? Another another feature in there. You uh, this allows us to unpack that in the user experience design, which brings high fidelity annotated interfaces into play. So we have a list of requirements, right? We, we're all soliciting these requirements and these business rules and things like that for these projects. And typically, and most you know, waterfall or agile mm -hmm. scenes, you know, for big application builds, that may be all you get. That's all you get. You get a list of requirements, your design team's supposed to build off that, your dev team's supposed to build off that. There's really, there's a huge gap between like, what does that actually mean? So for us, this user experience design combines the two. 
The software development process is typically one that's not as visual, quote unquote. You mentioned wireframes. If they're visual, it's usually where they stop. They stop at wireframes. We actually like to take that a step further. We take that a step further where we actually get to see, we can put a book in front of our clients. I actually forgot to bring them. God damn it. <laughs> um, if you want to see one after, let me know. I'll go grab one and you can look at one. Um, they actually bring a high fidelity concept into play with annotations, business requirements. So the graphic we've illustrated here on the left-hand side, it looks like a wireframe, but actually when we deliver these things, they are what the actual aesthetic and what the interface is gonna look like when we go into build. So when we go into front end, that's what it's gonna look like. So our clients can flip from page to page and see exactly what their application looks like on paper before we actually take it into to development. So that way we can really kind of align on scope, yeah. identify hiccups and gaps that we've had, allow them to contribute. I mean, I think that's a big thing too about these. These are daunting software applications and we deal with a myriad of departments. I mean, we're dealing with marketing, we're dealing with IT, we kind of play the middleman in those scenarios. This document it really allows us to kind of bridge the gap and say, you know, contribute marketing, contribute design. They can actually, you can distill a very, very technical and complicated process with visuals. And so that's what we do. I just jumped around the, no, the, no. the that's, thing uh, right there. <clears throat> that's really good. And I, I think, you know, having those annotations and really being able to see where things are connected to the interfaces uh, really make a lot of sense to clients. It makes a lot of sense to our teams. It really kind of helps tie everything together. So we're not only just documenting the features and functionality, but also like, you know, the requirements, the tests, mm -hmm. potentially the data. And a lot of times we use these documents as sort of the jumping off point for when our architects really get in and start figuring out what does the data model look like? What is the operating platform model? You know, trying to sort of sort out like what fields are going to be needed for this. You know, having that as sort of your, your uh, build book almost to really kind of make those decisions really does help a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a mashup. This document's a mashup of everything that each team needs. And we kind of tailor our process to who we need to tailor it to. So we have a non-technical client. Maybe it's a more marketing-focused website. You don't need the TSD, the technical specs documentation. You know, you don't, we don't need to include that. We have annotations that can kind of bend and flex in terms of fidelity we give them. But Adam mentioned a couple of things we do. We have, we, our QA team sets up their test scenarios based off this document. We keep this document up to date and running throughout the whole process of a build so that every team knows exactly what the scope of the, the application is. So things like, I mean, we have here, you can see a few, but we, I mean, business rules, interaction and workflows, uh, workflow insights, test cases, where data is brought in, where content needs to be provided, even measurements. I mean, I think that's huge too. We, we focus at Dynamic a lot on understanding what success criteria looks like. So when we go into any engagement, we go into any engagement, we say, what does success look like? We're looking at the site or this application a year from now. What does it look like? Did you get this many more users? Did you sell this much product? Like, what is it? Um, we set that stuff up in our project plan and we measure that stuff here and we attribute it to actual interfaces and places that it comes into play. Question. Uh, so do you, do you tailor these, these designs to the Sure. Sure. I mean, there's definitely there's definitely concessions that are made specifically for the the reason that you mentioned. We, I mean, user authentication, roles and levels inside of an application. You know how we handle that. Um, if it's significant enough, we blow that out separately. So you'll see, you know, if you are an ad, super admin versus if you're a regular user, here's what what it does. Now, the difference between those is. If, if there needs to be massive interface or workflow changes for those things to happen, we'll show those variations. If not, we'll document those changes in some what we call a style guide or a GUI template. Yeah. One of the things that we're doing actually plays nicely into what these guys are gonna talk about is setting up um, kind of our deliverable assets um, to our client, whether it's um, they're doing the dev or we're doing the dev. Um, we give them kind of those variations in that format so their dev team or our dev team knows exactly what those look like. Um, if they're not depicted visually, so when we have our document and you have the, the visual on the left and annotations on the right, if they're not depicted visually, we have other icons that represent non-visual representations of things. So if you're on a screen where a super admin sees X, Y, and Z, we say annotation three, super admin gets the ability to have this functionality on this page. 
So, and that's probably listed somewhere else in the application. So when that crossover happens, we have to find creative ways to make that connection. But we definitely account for that, not only in the UXD, but also in the deliverables that we give off. Did that answer your question, by the way? Yeah, I I mean, I think the, the, thing that, the thing that we try to do is, is kill assumptions. I mean, I think that when you go into these software builds, I mean, I think one of the things that happens is when you're working with a client specifically, you have what they think it's going to be versus what we think it's going to be. And if, it's, if it lives inside of what is a, what is a you know, use case scenario document that says, if I'm a user or if I'm an actor, I want to do X, Y, and Z, that's just that's just totally up to translation. That's totally up to speculation in terms of how it's going to be, how it's going to look, how it's going to work, what kind of you know rocks you want to turn over there. For us, what we found is when we show those visuals, you know, we can uncover those rocks and say, wow, we need to actually think about what our super admin sees here. We should probably make sure that's accounted for, and we go into a revision stage where we actually do that. So, for us, being able to uncover those types of things, mitigate the risk of those assumptions, um, this process has kind of allowed us to do that. Um, as we're going through the process with the client. Quick question, how concrete are your designs by the time you get to stop giving it over to the client? Because I would say about 95% of any mock-ups I've ever done are not you know, really going to look like the end bill by the time all the changes are done. Sure. It just seems like if they weren't like, approved, mm -hmm. you got to make iterations. Mm -hmm. We're going back and making a design and then we update this document. Totally. Good question, Stryker. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely something that evolves with the project. And I think we have a few examples of over time where we've, we've actually just taken screenshots of the application and then dropped them back into the UXD. Instead of going back and like redoing it in Photoshop, exporting it, importing it, handing it off to build. So I think that process is, is flexible, right? So like if we're far enough along that it makes sense to just build it in the, in the, app, and, you know, in the application and then sort of screenshot yeah. it and pull it back, that's what we end up doing. From a design process standpoint, um, we, try, we try to mitigate aesthetics as early as we can. I mean, for me, aesthetics are table stakes. I mean, any of us here can design a beautiful application. Um, I think for us, understanding like, the business requirements, what we're actually trying to accomplish, happens later in the game. And that's when things start to change in terms of like, we need to make this process go this way or this way. We actually do a stage in this document called um, project planning. And inside that project planning, we have a concept design. In that stage, we kind of get the visuals out there. We'll take some of the key interfaces, like for an e-com, home page, product detail page, for example, blow those things out and say, are you guys good with the brand direction, the visual direction, all the kind of little things that people can get hung up on, especially on the marketing side. Um, after that stage, we take those components, those aesthetics, and kind of blow them into the rest of the features that the package index defines. So after we pass that phase, visuals are almost kind of out of the question. In reality, then we're just kind of iterating on business rules and requirements that we uncover as we go down the pipeline. But like Adam said, there's a tipping point. I mean, there's a tipping point with designs where you, know, you get down, as if you're doing agile, if you're doing iterative, you know, where you may be doing 10 sprints, and after sprint five, you don't need to use Photoshop anymore. Like we can prototype straight from the GUI template that we've developed. We can prototype in browser, and I mean, Luke, if he's still back there, we, we've been doing this on a project we've been working on right now where a designer will go over to a developer and just jam with them for like 20 minutes and say, all right, we're going to reuse this component. Here's what this is supposed to look like. I'll draw you a sketch, give you a wireframe. Let's go from there. So at that point, then the developer just says, screen cap, we put in the documentation and we keep it up to date. So because for us, this document is ever changing. It's, it's ever evolving. Actually, when we go into these meetings, we give, we give clients pens and markers and say, help us mark this up. We, we want your feedback, mark this up. It's a living, breathing document. And so by the end of an application build, we look at that document and it's actually the full scope of what we actually did. And put it in the file, we keep it there. But it's always changing. And that's, that's one of the things that we've tried to work hard on in terms of like how to keep that updated and make it efficient. Yeah, one of the reasons that we do that though is because this is a document that we'll hand off to our QA team. And they can literally take this and look at, here's the annotation, here's what it's supposed to do, here's what it, you know, the browser support, all these different things and say, is this meeting these goals, right? So if we're always keeping it up to date, it's always sort of that system of record that they can then use to test with. Totally, totally. Cool. Any other questions? I mean, that's a big one. Mm-hmm. 
Sometimes. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, I think sometimes it creeps back into the conversation. I think that um, anytime you go hi-fi, there's the opportunity for somebody to raise their hand and say, I don't like this color. Um, we, we always tend to back up our designs with research and stuff too. I mean, we go into decision-making processes knowing what works and what doesn't. Occasionally, we'll do user testing and stuff like that too. Amongst our group, we'll use usertesting.com. We'll facilitate a user group at Dynamic if it's that big of an endeavor. Um, but yes, I mean, that does pop up from time to time. The reason that we don't think wireframes are a great deliverable all the time for clients is because nobody has foresight. When you get into an opportunity with a, with a big application build, specifically when you're working on something that is a little bit more fluffy when it comes to the actual design elements, like people need to see that. To be able to react and contribute and add valuable contributions to the conversation, to identify things that they like and they don't like, you have to show them what it is going to be. If you don't, when you get to the end and you actually show them the final design concept, they're going to be like, well, wait, wait a second. This isn't what I envisioned to being. <laughs> so up front, when we design these specs, like we really have to iron out the interfaces that we're going to design, those unique templates, if you will, so that we're not kind of iterating on those down the road or not creating 120 unique interfaces for an entire application. But that was really long-winded. Yes is the answer that does come back into play. We try to mitigate it as much as possible. I'm cool. talking a lot. That's all I got for that one. So, so benefits. I mean, yeah. the, the, the big problem, I think we, we think it, 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 software is difficult. I mean, there's requirements, there's, an, there's annotations, there's business rules, there's assumptions, there's all these things that you need to do. Clients. Clients. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the thing is, it's like this document really just takes an abstract, the abstract nature of defining requirements and makes them something that everybody can understand. And we've seen a lot, a lot of gains from being able to showcase these side-by-sides, the visuals with the abstract requirements and stuff, where people usually see as use cases or whatever, um, and, and really seen some gain from there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the other big things uh, that we maybe just touched on a little bit is that this process is really sort of methodology agnostic, right? I mean, we've used this in sort of waterfall type approaches. Mm -hmm. We use it in agile. We use it in mix, mixtures of those things. And I think it still works in, 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 in you know, any of those cases. One of the interesting things is, is like when you sort of look at things as sort of this smaller packages of uh, functionality, it really lends itself well to this iterative process where you're you know, essentially taking small pieces of the application, breaking them down, and really building those things in small little approaches. <coughs> You mentioned, uh, mentioned communication. I mean, I think one of the biggest things in any sort of scenario when you're dealing with clients or teams um, across the board, it's unified language. It's understanding what scope is. Yeah. I mean, I think we all deal with this when we, we build software. We all have assumptions in terms of what we think it's going to be versus what it's going to be. This document, these deliverables kind of allow us to mitigate those as much as possible. Um, and, and that relationship with our clients just even stronger when we get to the end. I mean, one of our biggest models at Dynamic is no surprises. Um, we never want to kind of pop up a change order and say, oh, wait, you know, we need to charge you more money for this. One of the things we try to do is keep everything online so there's no surprises as we build these applications for our clients. It just makes the relationship stronger. It makes everybody feel comfortable. Um, contribution is huge. I mean, being able to allow them to contribute to um, those conversations is big for us. I mean, it's, a, it's an experience. I mean, when you get to engage us in, or any of us in a, in a software build, I mean, it should be an experience and not overwhelming. It shouldn't be something that's so far over your head you don't want to raise your hand and ask a question. So we try to kind of make it something that people enjoy going through with us. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, I mean, it just really helps to simplify that technology process. So. Totally. Cool. So we got, that's you guys it. got any questions, thoughts? Just in general. Just in general. Yeah. Yeah. Where do babies come from? Is that what you're going for? <laughs> Must have been riveting. Yeah. Everyone's, no? Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a little break, bathroom break, get more tacos, whatever.